Hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God, have mercy on me, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. You, God, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, listen to my cry for mercy. When I am in distress, I call to you because you answer. Arrogant foes are attacking me. Ruthless people are trying to harm me. They have no regard for you. But you, Lord, are compassionate and gracious, God. Slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Show your strength in behalf of your servant. Save me because I serve you just as my mother did. Give me a sign, any sign of your goodness, that my enemies may see it and be put to shame. For you, God, have helped me and comforted me. Surrounded by a vast desert, the city of Jerusalem springs up out of the desert like a great mirage. Why build a city in the middle of a desert with no fresh water in sight for hundreds of miles? How can the walls of the Jerusalem temple illuminate a millennial old secret about this ancient city? What do the grounds of the temple hide from us today? And ultimately, What might this secret lost to history reveal for us today? There on the eastern slopes of Jerusalem is the Temple Mount, a walled compound within the old city of Jerusalem is the site of two magnificent religious structures, the Dome of the Rock to the north and the El Aqsa Mosque to the south. In the southwest stands the Western Wall, an ancient remnant of the Second Temple and what is now the holiest site in Jewish history. Jewish tradition holds that is the site where God gathered the dust to create Adam and where Abraham nearly sacrificed his son Isaac to prove his faith to God. Here King Solomon, according to the Bible, built the first temple on this mountaintop nearly 3,000 years ago in 1000 BCE. But the first temple was torn down nearly 400 years later by Babylonian troops commanded by the Babylonian emperor, Nebuchadnezzar. However, 50 years after the destruction of the first temple, after King Cyrus of Persia defeated the Babylonian empire, he would finance the rebuilding of the temple and create what scholars now call the second temple. In the first century BCE, King Herod would expand and refurbish the second temple. But shortly after Herod's expansion of the temple, the Roman Empire would burn and destroy the second temple, and the city of Jerusalem burned to the ground along with the temple. All that remains today is the Western Wall, where Jewish communities today gather for prayer. While the Western Wall today serves as a site of prayer, in 2012, archaeologists discovered something that was lurking deep below the wall. When part of the floor collapsed, archaeologists went down below the Western Wall and much to their surprise were shocked by their discovery. For archaeologists discovered a massive water reservoir sitting directly beneath the wall of the temple. The finding was incredibly significant because it was the first evidence of stored water next to the temple. Previously, experts had believed that pilgrims and residents living in ancient Jerusalem used to hike to the Gion Spring located in a wadi at the very bottom of the city. Thus, residents and pilgrims would need to take that water and trek all the way up to the temple. The discovery of this reservoir proved that the ancient city of Jerusalem 
maintained a massive and sophisticated water system. At the center of this massive water infrastructure was the temple, which served as a public reservoir where residents could draw their daily water. Thus, while the temple reservoir was in use, spring water running downhill from the Temple Mount would have seeped through one side of the reservoir and filled the entire room to capacity. This ancient discovery, hidden at the very bottom of the Western Wall, indicates that the ancient Israelites understood water's value. Moreover, at the heart of ancient Israelite religion was an acute sensitivity to the ecology of the land of Israel. Unlike ancient Mesopotamia or Egypt, there are no major rivers flowing into Jerusalem, making it almost completely dependent on rain and underground reservoirs for drinking water and agriculture. The temple was at the heart of ancient Israelites' sophisticated technology for utilizing water. It is for this reason that the Bible argues that water comes from heaven and it is under divine scrutiny, concern, and control. Water does not belong to any one person, but it belongs to everyone. And it was the responsibility of priests to ensure that everyone had access to water. If the priests did not fulfill their commitments to God, God will shut up the skies so there will be no rain and the ground will not yield its produce. And the death of the community will inevitably fall. Here, ecology, was interpreted theologically. The abundance or scarcity of water was not some random natural occurrence, but rather it was a failure on the part of human morality. Israel and the land of Israel were all bound together in one moral community where water fermented the bounds between individuals. It is for this reason that water plays a crucial role in the Hebrew Bible's creation story. In fact, in Genesis 1, creation is depicted as emerging out of the primordial deep, or tihom in Hebrew, which means water. All of creation emerges out of this primordial soup. In Psalm 104, the primordial water is brought under control by God, who transforms chaotic waters into peaceful streams channeled into conduits that water the land to support plant, animal, and human life. In Job 38, the primordial waters are also likened to a child being born from a womb. God sets limits to the waters and orders them to stay within certain boundaries. It is for this reason that rituals of water purification played a central role in Jewish ritual. For example, the ordination of priests, sacrifices, the cure of skin diseases, bodily emissions, and purification after contact with dead animals all necessitated the use of water. Even after the destruction of the temple, water rituals continued to play a central role in rabbinic Judaism. For example, with the use of full body immersions using a mikvah, a ritual bath, for rituals such as conversion and the purification of women after childbirth or menstruation. Water is even a metaphor for God himself in the Hebrew Bible. Water, wells, dew, rain, cisterns, and fountains serve as metaphors for God, or God's attributes. One of the most important and recurring metaphors for God, particularly in the prophetic books, is that of the fountain of living waters. Proverbs also uses the fountain of life as a metaphor for God's wisdom. And in the prophetic book of Amos, justice is referred to as water. In rabbinic texts, composed after the destruction of the temple, water is even a metaphor for the Torah itself because of water's necessity for life and as a transformative substance. Concern for water rooted in the very real ecology of the land of Israel created a rich and abundant vocabulary in which ancient Judaism expressed major theological and ethical ideas. The temple's elaborate and complex connections to water offer us an important prophetic vision today. Only 3% of the world's water is fresh water, and two-thirds of that is tucked away in frozen glaciers or otherwise unavailable for our use. As a result, some 1.1 billion people in the world lack 
basic access to water, and a total of 3 billion find water scarce for at least one month of the year. Water scarcity already affects every continent. Water use has also been growing globally at more than twice the rate of population increase in the last century, and an increasing number of regions are reaching the limit at which water services can be sustainably delivered. In the future, water scarcity will be exacerbated, as rapidly growing urban areas place heavy pressure on neighboring water resources. Climate change and bioenergy demands are also expected to amplify the already complex relationship between world development and world demand. There is not necessarily a global water shortage as such, but individual countries, regions, and communities need to urgently tackle the critical problems that develop from industrial water use, which cut off water access to communities. We need to develop integrated water resources which provide a broad framework for all communities to align water use patterns with the needs and demands of different communities, including the environment. The temple provides a model of how to do just that today, rather than siphon off water resources to a few at the expense of the many. The ancient Israelites instead developed a complex and sophisticated technological system to make sure that everyone had access to water. Ultimately, the temple reveals to us today that God is not high above, far removed from the earth or the environment, but God is here among us, embedded in our environment and communities. Water has always been a source of life and will remain so, especially in the future as we face ever and new renewed challenges. The temple calls upon us to develop the tools and technologies necessary to honor, respect, and protect our fountain of life. For water has and always will be our agent of purification, rebirth, and renewal.